Hey gang, before we get into worship and the word, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes to answer some of the questions that we've that we've gotten, and I'm sure that that, that more of you have had, and, and talk to you about what comes next. Uh, let me answer the one that, that I would think most of you would have, which is where are we going? When are we coming back together? Uh, I'm filming this Friday night, and so obviously things can change, and and I haven't talked this through with anyone yet. And and by the way, just so you're aware, how these decisions are being made Monday night and early Tuesday morning, this was talked through. Uh, thought through and prayed through by around 30 of us, staff, elders, medical people. And I haven't re-engaged them on this yet, uh, but I, I'm I'm operating under the, the assumption that we're, we're coming back together next next week at 9 and 11 and 6.30. And, and see, see, the beauty of the church with this is if you pause for one Sunday, you actually have taken 14 days off. And in this case, more than 14 days. So we, we'd be in good shape. And Again, that's that's not a decision that I'm going to make on my own, but but that's that's just what I'm assuming, the way I'm assuming things are going to go, and so we're, um, that's kind of my thought process right now. We'll see where, where everybody else is. Um, we were supposed to start the the ten o'clock service that week. We'll, we'll have to see what we do with that. That this has slowed us down a little bit, so stay tuned. But but as far as everything else, that's that's where I'm gonna. I think things are going to go. Another question we got was was by shutting down, aren't we acting just like the world? And, and, and no, I don't, I don't think so because where the world is, and, and unfortunately, where many people in the church, uh, where many people in the churches are right now, is they've jumped into one of two camps. There's the the crippling fear camp, and then there's the rage and anger camp. And I, I don't think the church, I don't think the church can be in either of those camps. That that's where the world is. That's where many individual Christians are. But for the church. While trying to minister to both camps, we can't be in either one, and I, I think that's that, I, as I'm, you know, hearing from other pastors, that's where pastors have really felt like um, what we've been since March that that we are kind of stuck in between fearful people we love and and angry people that we love, and we, we need to be able to think through both freedom and safety. And, and I spent I spent way too much time over the last nine months trying to, to think through the theological implications of COVID and, and church shutdowns and Romans 13 versus Romans 14, and enough to talk for days on that. And I, I don't have that amount of time, but but l- let me just say this for this subject. We value freedom and we value safety. And it's funny because we're accused by people uh, of being of both going too much freedom or too much safety. I'm not sure how you, I'm not sure how you do both of those things at, at the same time, but apparently that's kind of the world we live in right now. I want to look at it from a theological point of view, though, because that's that's, that's what we do, right? Um, if you come at it, 
if you come at this strictly from the, the safety point of view and, and, and churches need to guarantee that nothing can ever happen to anyone. And, and, and by the way, we, we can't do that. Even, even if this virus was gone, we still could not do that. And neither can Walmart and neither can Lowe's and neither can your neighbor when they come over for that matter. But, but try to explain that view of safety to the Apostle Paul as, as he goes from city to city in the book of Acts. You're, you're not going to get far with him on that. Now, at the same time, if you come at it strictly from a freedom standpoint, you need to be careful there, theologically speaking. The, the theologian, uh, Don Carson, good theologian, he said, and I don't, I don't know that this was specifically a COVID study. I think it was a Paul study. But he said, he was studying the Apostle Paul, and he said when Paul would, would go from city to city, a lot of times, a lot of danger would come. A lot of things would happen to him. And he was trying to figure out what would make Paul leave the city, because sometimes danger would come and he would leave. And what would make Paul stay in the city, because sometimes danger would come and he would stay. And what he found, what he, he found is most of the time, when Paul would stay in a city, it was because he was by himself. And when he would leave a city, it was because he had other people that were around him that, that there was a danger to them. Um, he left when he was with others for the sake of others, but he wasn't as much worried about his own sake. See, we're not we're not the anti-safety church. We want to keep people safe. This weekend kind of shows that. And and we also, at the same time, want to combat the mindset of the day where my life needs to be bubble wrapped and live a life that's completely safe. That's not really a healthy mindset either. Another question we've gotten, and we've gotten this a lot over the last uh, nine months, is we've been asked, isn't this just a response of fear? Isn't this, are you just responding out of fear? Um, listen, we do believe that COVID is real, and it is especially dangerous for certain segments of our population, older people, um, those who are immune compromised. Um, but, and Sarah told me not to answer this question this way, but I think the relationship that we've always had is I've always just kind of said it and just been real with you. And that's kind of the way we go. Um, this question over the last nine months has really, has annoyed me. Um, and as we say in the U.S. for it series, you're, you're welcome to ask questions. We aren't afraid of questions, but that doesn't mean I don't reserve the right to be annoyed by a question here or there. Um, because to ask, is this a response of fear, is to do a couple things. One, it's, I think it's to, to throw out a, an opinion without having to hold the weight of responsibility. Everyone, when we came back in May, I said kind of the word I thought God had given me was everybody has an opinion, but not everybody has to carry the weight and the responsibility. And so it's, you kind of have that side, but you, you also, to, to throw out that question, I think is, is, to, is to ignore the actions of the last six months that we've taken. You're, you're forgetting that, that we were one of the first churches to reopen. You're forgetting that, that we are one of the only churches to have kids men going full, full force because we see, the danger, we see the danger of this to younger people as being very low. And, and we really believe that the damage it is having on our kids is astronomical. And, and they need other kids and they need some kind of normalcy and they need, they need, they need the Lord. And, 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 for, and, and, and then for crying out loud, we, in the middle of this, we plan, we helped plan a church and we launched a new campus at a new location. And, and so I think our actions would speak loudly on this. And, and so I would just ask, you know, if you have any more, um, if you wanted to ask the fear question again after after this, I, I would say respectfully reserve those questions for Jason. Ask him those questions then <laughs> from now on. Uh, we're going to do one more and then we'll, we'll get into worship. Uh, i got the question, are we going to shut down every time someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone gets the sniffles? That That wasn't what this was. Because of who was infected and who that person was around, this had the potential to, to blow up on us fast. And, and the right and wise thing to do was to shut it down before it could. And as I sit here tonight, it, it looks like, Lord willing, that we were able to, to shut it down. And so we're, we're very thankful for that. Now, I can't say we're the winner that we'll never have to do it again for a week. I, I, don't, I don't know that. But what I can say to you, what I can promise you, is I've never been stronger in my conviction that the gathering of God's people has infinite value. I've loved the local church since I was in, in fourth grade, which is well before I was saved. And, and But March, April, and May convinced, convinced me more than ever that the gathering of God's people has infinite value. It, 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 the, the, the online experience, when it, we first had to move to online only, there was a novelty to it. And, and 
uh, a, a lot of churches, including us, just saw an incredible spike in, 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 in that there was more people watching online than we'd ever seen in, in person. So the gospel was getting out to more people than we, we had ever, ever had in, in the room. And there was a national, kind of a national conversation the church is going, well, is this going to be a part of, of what the church is? Is the church going to move to, you know, in the future, are people just going to want an online experience only? And that had even been a conversation before COVID. But but as we moved forward, what we began to realize is 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 no, there's just, there's, we, we, we reaffirm the fact that there's something about the gathering. There's something about being in the room together that you can't get online. We're thankful for online. We're thankful for it as a supplement when that's all that, that can happen. But but there's something about gathering in the room and being under the word of God and and, and, and worshiping together and the, and the thousands of conversations and the thousands of connections that, that happen when, when, when you're together in the room that you just can't get uh, in the online experience. And so I would say that we believe in the, the, the importance of the gathering even more now than we did uh, even this time last year. Uh, there's, there's, just, there's, the, there's a theological conviction for people to gather in person. There, now, there's a lot of graces, especially in this season where there's a lot of people who, who just you can't, you can't gather in person. And, and that's, that's, that's okay, but it's hard to look at the Bible or the history of the church and think it's okay for the church not to gather in person for a long period of time. Imagine again, trying to tell the apostle Paul um, not to have the church gather for a long period of time. It's probably not gonna happen. We also, you look around and you know this, you feel this, you know that people aren't doing well. Separating people from people, it just, it just for long periods of time, the, the depression and anxiety is off the roof. The anger and the fear is, is through the roof. Drug addiction and, and death by overdose. And, and, and not to mention that people are still getting cancer and having heart disease. And, and, and now they're, they're asked to, to do it alone, to go through it alone because they have to be separated. Kids are isolated from other kids and it's not working out for them. And, and just people, if we were created for two things, to love God and love people, but um, it's tricky to to love people but never actually be around people. And just the fact that online ministry is just not as good as it is in person. We're we're, we're doing we're going to do the best we can. Other churches are going to do the best they can, but but no church is able to minister online as well as it's able to minister in person. It just it just can't happen. And so for the time being, we're you know we're going to have people who who have come back, and and you know more than more than half the church at this point has, has come back and. And, and and that's a great thing. And it's been, one of the, the the interesting things that that has happened is as people have got come back, they've a lot of people have said very similar things to me. They, they've said, you know, these are really godly people who who were 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 you know, church was part of their life, but then they moved to the online and they came back and they said, I forgot what it was like to be in the room. I forgot what it was like to gather in the room where it's happening. And some people were even crying when they first first came back just because there's something about being in the room. And then there's the people who, who can't come back. Some of you, are, you who are older or you are immune compromised, you should not come back yet. And that and you shouldn't feel guilty about that. Don't I, a lot of, I'll, I'll, When I, I talk to some, some of you guys, and you'll say, hey, I'm sorry, I just get, that's okay. That's, that's the wise, that, that, that's, this isn't about, Let's guilt everyone in one direction or the other. It's about let's make the what's the wisest choice and what God is calling you as an individual to do. And, and there's some of you you should not come back yet. It's, it's not time for you to come back yet. And then there's other of you that, that shouldn't come back and it's a week to week category. Like if you have a fever, if you feel sick, don't come. And this isn't just for with COVID. You have a fever. Don't come to church that week. It's, that's what the online experience is about. If you've, if you've been around someone who's sick, if you're visiting your 97-year-old grandma on Tuesday, maybe this week just tune in online, right? That, that, that's just, just wisdom. And then there's people that, and that, that just, they're, they're not going to come back. So a guy named Tom Rayner who does research in the church world, and he, he really, um, it's kind of what he does. And, and he, he's, they're, what they're seeing is about 10 to 30% of, of people from churches, depending 10 to 30, are, they're never coming back. Because some people have been given the biggest hall pass ever, a global pandemic as an excuse to do nothing. And if they were a constant critic of the church, of, of, of whatever church they're a part of, they're loving this because no church is doing this perfectly. It just, it just not hap- it's just impossible. And it reveals, what this is doing is it's going to reveal who saw church as just another activity to add on because as it, because it just got harder 
to, to be a part of things and they're not willing to do it. There, there's that, but then there's also, and we talked about this a couple months ago, and we've seen a good influx of this and we're excited, is the, the people who who will and are coming. Um, a little more than half our people can, are, have come back and yet some of you guys look around the room and go, well, really, is that all? It feels like it's more than that. And the reason for that is a because the chairs are socially distanced that you know so that that makes a difference but also because we're 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 seeing we're drawing a ton of new people um just people who had tuned in online like i had said in the in the beginning and have come or or just people who are, are are realizing the importance now of of this or people who who really were in the area really struggled with anxiety or depression and, and beginning to realize maybe there's something out there that I need and, and, and we're just seeing an incredible influx in the gospel and we are just so thankful for those of you guys who have really stepped up and served and ministered in 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 kind of the interim period while we're waiting for everyone else to come back and, and again not everybody should come back yet I'm not saying that but while we're waiting for everyone to come back and jump into where where God has has placed them we're so thankful for those you guys that have have taken on the extra because you know that it matters you know that you're making a difference. You know that that we're st we're still seeing the same amount of baptisms in the middle of COVID as we were seeing when it when it wasn't in COVID. It's just incredible what God is doing. You guys are making a huge difference. We're so thankful for for how God is is ministering amongst us. We're 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 looking. We're we're expecting to be back together in person next Sunday, and we're excited to see what God is going to do because the best is still yet to come.
morning. God bless you.
Good morning, and thank you for joining us here. We are in our second week of the At The Movie series. Now, this is a series that we do where we take a movie and we will try and apply a biblical principle to either the plot or the story. Now, this is something that we didn't do here, we didn't start it here, but we believe it was started by a church that was in Oklahoma. But the basic idea of it is to take and do what Jesus did. Now, Jesus didn't have you know, a movie night with his friends and sit around and eat popcorn, but what he did was he took the ideas of the things that were going on in society when he was here, whether it was farming, agricultural, or shepherding, and apply them to some kind of understanding or a teaching tool that people can relate to. Because the idea is that if you can tie something or apply it to something that you're familiar with, it's more likely to stick with you. That's the same idea with this series. Now, while farming, shepherding, and agriculture are still going on right now, it's probably not the most identifiable or relatable thing that most of us know about. The thing that most of us will have known about or can relate to in our culture today that plays a bigger part of what's going on in our life that influences us more is media and technology. Take, for example, I'm sure that everybody on here right now has a phone. I'm also sure that most of you probably have a smartphone. Now, we'll take it a little step farther. Now, most of you probably have a TV. At the, end of the day, at the end of the day, most of us can relate to what's going on on that phone or on that TV better than we can relate to what's going on out in a farm here. That's why we do a series like this. Now, take for example, if I told you that the best feed to give a chicken would be all natural GMO, soy free, five grain premium scratch and relate that to a biblical principle, you'd probably be like, what in the world is this guy talking about? He has no clue. But if I would say that Baby Yoda had come to save his race and look out for the Mandalorian and take care of everything, everybody would be like, oh my word, Baby Yoda is so adorable. Because that's what you can relate to and that's what's going on right now that you can understand. Now, the other thing that we like to do with a series like this is we kind of build in another topic. And with this one here is that we talk about and we read in the Bible all the time that it says that there is an unseen world. Now, we live in a world that we can physically see, smell, and touch. But Scripture all too often tells us that there's also one that our eyes cannot see. Now, wanting to take the approach of using that along with the movies, we are trying to view these things from a perspective of things are not always as they seem. Kind of like when you look at something over and over, time after time, similar to today's movie, you see the same thing that you always see. But what happens when you go a little deeper, when you clear away the top cover, and you keep digging until you get to the root of the story? And it gives you a different perspective, something that you may never have seen before. Similar to today, I'm sure earlier in the week, you thought you were going to be coming to MCC and joining us at the, at the movie series here in the building. But you probably would have never thought that you'd be sitting at home in your pajamas watching me, you know, the youth director, the guy who hangs out with teenagers, talking about It's a Wonderful Life. You're probably thinking, like, shouldn't this guy be talking about Die Hard or Gremlins or Home Alone or Nightmare Before Christmas? After all, what does this guy know about such a classic movie? How can he relate to a masterpiece? Well, It's a Wonderful Life was one of those classic movies that has become a family tradition for most people, especially on Christmas Eve. The funny thing is, It's a Wonderful Life actually did not do so well in the box office. And it would have been considered probably a box office bomb. The thing is, though, I wouldn't have experienced this back in the theater, and contrary to some belief, Natalie, that it wasn't until it was actually on TV 
and what we refer to as public domain that began to gain popularity and became the movie that we all know and love today. The other thing is, too, the film was based on a short story entitled The Greatest Gift. And that was written by Philip Van Doren Stern in 1943. And now the, main fi- the film's main character, George Bailey, a big-hearted man at a very young age, had this desire to go out and see the world. He had all these big hopes and big dreams to leave this little town of Bedford Falls and venture out to see the world. Although, unfortunately, with most dreams, sometimes they don't always work out the way that we want them and the way we plan them. George's life takes a quick U-turn. And this is where we begin to see that sometimes our plans do not always line up with God's purpose on our life. Here's the thing. I watched this film about 12 years ago for the first time with my wife, who loves Christmas movies. Okay, it was one of those moments where she's like, hey, um, can we watch this movie? And I was like, sure. And I think she was a little scared and a little reluctant because of the fact that it was a black and white film. But little did she know that I actually enjoy watching black and white films. You see, when I was in high school, you know, back when tablets were still pens and papers and phones had tails on them, I had this class that was introduced to me as media studies. Now, when they kind of told us about this class, they said, hey, all you have to do is sit around and watch movies and critique them. So I don't care what anybody says. If you're telling a bunch of teenagers that all they have to do is sit around and watch movies and talk about them all semester, it's, I'm a, it's a done deal. But that's where I think I got duped, okay? Or at least that's what I had thought. You see, the class load was comprised of nothing but black and white films, like Citizen Kane and Psycho. Now, yes, yeah, Psycho. Probably not the best idea to show a bunch of teenagers Psycho in class. They did it anyway, though. But hey, you know what? At the end of the day, we all found out that since these films did not have color, and the film's directors had to do different things, and they had to actually get creative with how they filmed these movies. They had to, you know, come up with tricky camera angles and different lighting and all these different things to be able to portray and show the character's emotions and try and deliver a nice atmosphere of the film. So, needless to say, next time you watch a black and white film, you can look for like different camera angles, lighting and all that kind of stuff to kind of say, oh wow, that's something that, that's what Mike talked about. Because actually, if you ever watch this film, there's like a couple scenes like that in here where they zoom really close in on George's face, where they kind of just get his tension and kind of get his feel. So you kind of, you actually feel it when you watch it. So check it out if you, next time you watch this. So anyway, Needless to say, at the, end of the, at the end of the class, I really found out that I actually had this deep appreciation for black and white films because of so much the energy and effort that goes into these things that kind of like gave you like a whole new, I don't know, like new appreciation for filmmaking back before color. But the thing that also that came along with that appreciation and that newfound knowledge of what I had in high school was... I also developed the the usual things that you have when you when you're in high school, and that's you know you usually develop that acne and the social awkwardness. But the other thing that you I developed at that time was that anxiety of what I was going to do with my life after I got out of school. You know, this is that question that you get asked almost your entire life while you're in school, and you know it's what are you going to do when you grow up? Or what are you going to do with your life? And I know as a parent, I'm guilty of doing this with my kids. Now, I'm not asking them what they're going to do with their life when they grow up. But what I'm doing is I see them and how they interact with what they do in their day to day. And I'm like, oh, that must be great. Like, you know, for example, like I, my, I see my son, he draws this picture and it's like, oh, look, he's going to be an artist one day. Or, you know, I see how they play with their Legos. Like, oh, wow, look at their Legos. They're going to be an architect. Or I see how they interact with our cat and how they take care of him, care of her, and I say, oh, well, maybe he's going to be a vet one day. Or 
this kid bangs on everything. He's going to be a drummer. At least I hope he's going to be. But on the other side of things, there always comes a point in time in your life when you're about to graduate. And this is when you really need to ask yourself, what are you going to do with your life? But once you actually realize what that is, you need to get up and go after it and figure it out. Because that's what George did. George knew everything that he was going to do every step of the way. Hey, hey Mary. What do you say I throw this rock at that old Granville house? Oh no, don't. I love that old house. No? Wait. No? You see you make a wish and then I try and break some glass. You got to be a pretty good shot nowadays. Oh no, George, don't. It's full of romance, that old place. I'd love to live in it. In too. that place? Uh-huh. I wouldn't live in that as a ghost. Now watch. Right on the second floor there. What'd you wish for, George? Well, not just one wish, a whole hat full. I know what I'm gonna do tomorrow, and the next day, and the next year, and the years after that. I'm shaking the dust off this little crummy little town, off my feet, and I'm gonna see the world. Italy, Greece, Parnathrion, the Colosseum. And then I'm coming back here to go to college, and I'm gonna show them what they know. And I'm gonna build, I'm gonna build things, I'm gonna build, Airfields, I'm gonna build skyscrapers a hundred towers tall. I'm gonna build bridges miles long. Are you gonna throw that rock? Hey, that's pretty good. What'd you wish for? Buffalo gals, won't you come out tonight? Come out tonight, come out tonight. Buffalo, Buffalo gals, gals won't you come, come out tonight? tonight. And dance on to the light of the moon. What do you wish for when you threw that rock? Oh no. Come on, tell me. Well, if I told you, it might not come true. What is it you want, Mary? You, what do you want? You want the moon? Just say. I'll take it. And then what? The word, and I'll come throw a lasso around it, and I'll pull it down, Mary. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. I'll take it, and then what? Well, then you can swallow it, and it all dissolve, see? And the moonbeams shoot out from your fingers and your toes and the ends of your hair. Am I talking too much? Yeah. George knew everything. He had it all figured out. He was going to shake the dust from this town off his shoes and go out and see the world. The thing that I thought was funny about it was that he was going to, once he got back from seeing the world, he was going to go back to school and see what they knew, almost as if he knew better than what they did. But the funny thing is, George had everything figured out. He had everything figured out every step of the way. All his plans lined up. There's only one thing that he didn't account for. His plans were not God's plans. And we read in James 4, 13 through 15, it says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't make plans. But what it does mean is that you have to realize that at some point in time, your plans don't always line up exactly with God's purpose on your life. It's like looking into these mirrors. This one's clear. And this is the one that we think that we're looking into. And then you have this one that's all distorted and disproportioned. All the bends and the ripples. You see, when we make our plans, 
We think we're looking at this one because we think that we can plan for everything. We think that we can see into the mirror. We can see into the future and say, we're going to do this or that. When actually, this is the mirror that we should be looking into. Because only God can see what we're going to do. We can't see past one minute in our life. So why do we think that we can fool ourselves by looking into a mirror or looking into our future that the only thing that we can see is ourselves? And we fail to see everything that is going on around us. So as we go about life and understand that this is the one that we should be using, this is the one that we should look into and say, this is our life. We should be praying along all the dips and the bends that through our life and know that God's there preparing a way for us. You see, Proverbs 27, 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring. George had all these great plans. But what you didn't get to see was at the end of our scene, his life would have changed forever. Now, this is a spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen the movie, so I apologize, Matt, if you haven't watched this and I'm about to spoil it for you. But George's dad dies at the end of that scene. Okay? George will be forced into taking over his father's broken business. And that, remember that scene I talked about earlier where I said that it gets really intense and it get, gets in George's face? Well, that's one of them right there. This happened because the thing is, if George wouldn't have taken over his father's business, it would have fallen into the hands of Potter, who was the town Scrooge. And he would have just run it into the ground. So in turn, George gave up his college money to his brother with the agreement that when Harry, George's brother, would return, that Harry would then run the business so George can go off to school. But unfortunately, even those plans didn't work out for poor George. You see, when Harry returned back from school, he was then married. And the plan was for him to go work at his father-in-law's business. Too happy for his brother, George didn't stand in his way. But this is where George began to realize that the big plans of him going off to school and seeing the world were starting to fade. And he began to realize that he was going to be stuck in that small town working at the same job that he doesn't want. But unfortunately, everyone is counting on him to keep the thing running. Now, I'm sure this sounds like some of us on here right now. I'm positive that a lot of you right now had all these great plans in high school. But they never happened. How many of you have given up on your dream because of something that may have happened in your life? I doubt that many of you are working at the job that you wanted when you were in high school. I mean, I wanted to be a history teacher, but I didn't have the money and I really didn't have the grades for it. So I gave up on that. But in most cases, the things that we wanted to do when we grew up or, or the plans that we had when we, were, when we were in high school are kind of a distant memory and they just kind of fade away. I mean, what if you were an athlete, but an injury ended your sports career? And not to mention, because of that injury, you lost your scholarship that you worked so hard to achieve. Or maybe you had all these hopes and aspirations of becoming some, some great person one day. But an unplanned pregnancy forced you to not even be able to finish high school. Maybe you're like George and you wanted to see the world. But a family member's death kept you at home because no one else could take care of the family. And now maybe, now this one's going to be the craziest one of all, maybe, just maybe, 
you actually got to do your dream job. And that's what you were doing right now. But you've come to realize that you hate it and you despise it more than anything that you could even imagine. Or maybe, lastly, maybe everything for you is going in the toilet. But then you look around at your friends and your family and you see that everything is working out perfectly for them. Everything's falling right into place. And it's almost as if they have been given everything on a silver plier and they have to earn nothing. Maybe that's where you're at right now. But what if I said all these things happen for a reason? And what happens if I said that they happen because they were supposed to? Not because God wants to crush you or not because he wants to keep you in your place. What if I told you that it isn't about you? What if I told you that it's how God wants to use you because it's about his purpose and not your plans? Proverbs 16, 9 reads, In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. With George, any time that he brought up about his dreams, it was about what he wanted to do, what he wanted to learn, what he wanted to see. When George started seeing that all, his, all of the things that were working out for everyone else but him, his emotions started getting the better of him. He started kind of, his emotions just got, started taking a hold of who he was. And when he went over to visit Mary after she returned back from college, he winds up ending with a bold statement. We're both here. Come here. I have a big deal coming up. It's, it's going to make us all rich. George, you remember that night in Martini's bar when you told me you read somewhere that about making plastics out of soybeans? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soybeans. Yeah. Well, Dad snapped up the idea. He's going to build a factory outside of Rochester. What do you think of that? Rochester? Why Why Rochester? Well, why not? Do you think of anywhere else better? Oh, I don't know. Why not right here? You remember that old tool and machinery works. You tell your father he could get that for a song. And all that labor he wants too. Half the town was thrown out of work when they closed down. That's so. Well, I'm telling you, hey, that sounds great. Oh, baby, I knew you'd come through. Now, here's the point. Mary, Mary, you're in this too. Now listen, have you got any money? Money? Well, little. Well, now listen, I want you to put every cent you've got into our stuff here. And George, I may have a job for you. That is, unless you're still married to that broken down building and loan. <laughs> This is the biggest thing since radio, and I'm letting you in on the ground floor. Mary? Mary? Um, I'm here. Would you tell this guy I'm giving him the chance of a lifetime here? The chance of a lifetime. He says it's the chance of a lifetime. Now you listen to me. I don't want you to get any plastics, I don't want any ground floors, and I don't want to get married, ever. To anyone, you understand that? I want to do what I want to do. And you're, and you're, oh, oh, Mary. George. Mary. George. Mary. I want my life back. Yeah, we might have these big plans and these grand ideas, but in the end, God is going to put us where he wants us. Eventually, your plans and God's purpose on your life will intersect. The funny thing is, though, that you probably will not realize that until it's too far, too late. I mean, this is exactly the same thing that George was facing. He did not see everything that was going on around him until it was too late. You see, George was always there to help everyone in town. Okay, he would loan people money. He would be there to help build home, affordable homes for them. He would give them a community to live in. He was always there when people needed him. And at the end of the day, everyone counted on George. 
Unfortunately, George did not always see this because he got so wrapped up with everything else that was going on around him that he missed the fact of how much he blessed those around him. George, like so many people in the Bible, were the same way. And we're missing the point that God was moving and how he was moving in their lives. And none the more stuck out to me the most than Jonah. You see, now many of us know the story of Jonah. Yeah, he was the guy that got swallowed up by the fish and he got spit out three days later. But there's so much more to that story than that. That's more like the Sunday school version, like all wrapped up nice and knit in a bow. But let's dig a little deeper. Jonah was commissioned by God to go and spread God's word among the lands. Until the time came when God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. You see, at that time, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. But what little, of us, little do we know that the Assyrians were the ones who were responsible for most of the destruction that took place in the northern kingdom of Israel, which Jonah helped to rebuild. So I can kind of see why he had these kind of mixed feelings about going and doing what he was supposed to do. But you see, a lot of time we look at the story of Jonah, we look at it as a guy who didn't listen to God, and God took him off and punished him and then put him back on track. But in most cases, it wasn't God trying to punish Jonah for disobeying. It seemed like it was more of the situation where God was trying to refocus or redirect Jonah's attention away from himself and what Jonah wanted to do and put the attention to those around him and everyone that Jonah encountered. You see, Jonah, just like George, missed out on the fact that everyone that he came into contact with changed because of who he was. Now we see this first redirect or this refocus right in the beginning of the book of Jonah. And it starts in Jonah 1 verses 1 through 3. And it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amity. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come to up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, which instructed him to go to Nineveh and preach against the wickedness of the city. Unfortunately, Jonah must not have felt like doing it, or he didn't feel like listening to the Lord. Or maybe it was just not what he wanted to do. Remember, the Ninevites were the ones who were responsible for most of the destruction of Israel. So more than anything, I can see why Jonah probably had hard feelings towards them. So in the end, it looked like it was more about what Jonah wanted and to do and less about what was going on around him. This is also where God tries to get Jonah's attention. So after Jonah ran to do his own thing, this is what God did. And this starts in verse 4 and 5. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All of the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. When the violent storm came, the men cried out. These were seasoned sailors. These guys lived on the sea. So obviously this was more than just a little bit of a rainstorm. This had to be nasty, especially if it was going to break the ship up. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is where it says they were quick to cry out, to his own God. It's that part there, his own God, which means that each one of those crewmen were worshiping or serving something that was proprietary to themselves, and it was either something or someone that they alone had worshiped. But it wasn't the one true God. So as the story goes on, the men cast lots as the story or as the storm preceded and when the lot fell on Jonah he was like yeah, guys it was me I'm the reason for the storm just throw me in the water and you'll be all safe but they didn't really believe that they were kind of reluctant to want to throw him in the water 
but they wound up doing it anyway. And this is what it says in verses 14 through 16. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you. Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the rage and sea grew calm. At this time, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. It's crazy to think that these crewmen turned from serving their own God, something that they served individually, to serving the one true God so quickly. Unfortunately, Jonah probably missed this part because he was probably sinking into the war about to be gobbled up. But nonetheless, Jonah ran from God. And because he did that, he was on that ship that God sent the storm. And that now all the crewmen serve and worship God. Not their own God, but the one and only God. Isn't that usually the case, though? Think of it this way. How many of us have found salvation in a time of our lives when we were in the middle of a storm? When you're at your lowest, when everything is going wrong, where everything is falling apart, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your marriage, or maybe even your family dynamics, or maybe things are just not adding up and you don't know how you're going to make it through. Some might consider those a storm of life. So ask yourself, how many of us were faced with a storm then we turned away from our own gods? And now those might have been money, drugs, food, alcohol, and then we turn to God. Usually when this happens, we find ourselves at the end of our rope and nowhere left to turn. Now George... He was about to be faced with the biggest storm yet. Everything was about to come crashing down around him. You see, his uncle, his absent-minded uncle, lost that day's deposit. And now, since he was making that deposit, the bank records would look as though George was either embezzling or stealing the money because the physical money was never deposited. So we find George going to what he thinks is his second to last resort. Oh God. God, dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Oh, show me the way, God. George finds himself at the end of his rope, praying out to a God. George even says that he is not a praying man. George is asking him for help, an answer to a prayer. Similarly, Jonah does the exact same thing after he got tossed over the side and swallowed up by the fish. We find Jonah praying and crying out to God in Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed out to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to you, Lord, and he answered me. From the deep, in the realm of the dead, I called for your help, and you listened to my cries. Pretty much in either of these situations, both George and Jonah have nothing left and have both have hit rock bottom. And they both go to the one person that they know will help them without a doubt. But does this path of George and Jonah sound like any of us? I mean, how many of us wait to the last minute to go to God for help? When in fact, he should be the first one that we're going to. It's not like he doesn't know exactly what we're going to do when we're going to do it. I mean, do you really think that God didn't realize that Jonah was going to run when he did? Of course he did. But why is it that we wait so long? And it's not until we get to the point where we have nowhere else to go and we don't think there's anyone left to help. And that is when we finally turn to God. I mean, is it because that we've done so many things on our own without having to ask for help that we don't think that we need him? Or is it that we think that we're always the one 
that it's helping everyone else. And then in turn, we actually don't know how to ask for help ourselves. But the thing is, though, that when we don't ask for help, we kind of cave in on ourselves and we truly hit bottom and we become the shell of a person that we once were. I mean, why do you think that suicide's on the rise? It's because we don't ask for help. Yes, why do you think that anxiety and depression are running like wildfire? Yes, COVID and lockdowns have a big part to play in it, but anxiety and depression have been running rampant long before 2020 hit. When life becomes overwhelming, we usually get to the point where we feel like we are done with life and we're ready to throw in the towel. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now that's the NIV translation. Other translations read it, it says, cast your burdens, cast your cares. But all of them end with because he cares for you. And that's the one thing that God wants. God wants us to trust him, give him our anxieties, our burdens, the things that we cannot bear on our own. Jonah ran because he was scared and bitter. Yes, George didn't know what to do since he was always the one helping everyone else. But sadly, George was at the point, at the end of his rope, planning to jump in a river but just as George was about to jump, he got the answer to his prayer. An unsuspecting angel that when he realized that George, what George was about to do, the angel himself jumped in first because he knew what kind of a person George was and he knew that he would sacrifice himself to help someone else before doing it himself. Oh, brother, I wonder what Martini put in those drinks. Hey, what's with you? What did you say just a minute ago? Why'd you want to save me? That's what I was sent down for. I'm your guardian angel. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Ridiculous you to think of killing yourself for money. $8,000. Yeah, just things like that. How'd you know that? I told you, I'm your guardian angel. I know everything about you. Well, you look like kind of an angel I'd get. Sort of a fallen angel, aren't you? Hey, where are your wings? I haven't won my wings yet. That's why I'm an angel of the second class. I don't know whether I like that very much, being seen with an angel without any wings. Well, I've got to earn them, and you'll help me, won't you? Sure. Sure, how? By letting me help you. Only one way you can help me. You don't happen to happen to have an extra $8,000 on you, do you? <laughs> no, 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 we don't use money in heaven. Oh, that's right, I keep forgetting. Comes in pretty handy down here, Bob. <laughs> I found it out a little too late. I'm worth more dead than alive. Now look, you mustn't talk like that. I won't get my wings with that attitude. You just don't know all that you've done. If it hadn't been for you, yeah, if it hadn't been for me, everybody would be a little bit better off. My wife, my kids, my friends. Look, little fellow, go off and hunt someone else, will ya? You don't understand. I've got to do my job. Ah, shut up, will ya? This isn't going to be so easy. So you still think killing yourself would make everyone feel happier, eh? Oh, I don't know. I guess you're right. I suppose it would be a little better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. Yeah, you mustn't say things like that. You, wait a minute. That's an idea. What do you think? Yeah, that'll do it. All right. You've got your wish. You've never been born. Ooh. You don't have to make all that fuss about it. What'd you say? You've never been born. You don't exist. 
You have a care in the world. No worries, no obligations, no $8,000 to get, no potter looking for you with the sheriff. Why is it that we are so quick to throw everything away when they don't work out how we have them planned to go? Just like George Jonah's plans didn't go exactly how he had them planned. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, Nineveh to save the Assyrians because he knew that God would show favor to them if they turned from their ways. And when they did, you can look at Jonah's response. I mean, you would think that it would be like, oh, hey, thanks, God, for uh, saving the fellow man. But no, it really wasn't like that. And this is found in Jonah 4.23. He prayed to the Lord. That's Jonah. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than live. Jonah was upset with God because he would have rather had the Ninevites be destroyed because that is what Jonah's plan was. Unfortunately for Jonah, while he was wallowing in his self-pity for his own plans not working, he missed out on the fact of God's purpose on his life. And like I said earlier, we tend to think punished Jonah with the big fish, and he took, but what he really did is he took Jonah off of Jonah's course and put Jonah back on God's course. I mean, how many of you guys, and I think that every one of us can relate to this, that all too often we are on our own course, but we feel that tugging, we feel that pulling, and what that is, is that's God's trying to take us off of our own course and put us back onto his. You can think of it this way. If Jonah didn't run and get on that boat, none of that crew would have been saved and none of them would worship and serve God. If Jonah didn't go to Nineveh and tell the Assyrians of the coming judgment, 120,000 people would have been lost. Jonah missed it on the fact that as a person of God, we are supposed to be a blessing on those around us. Now, I think this happens a little more often than what we think. Now, and I also think it happens more than what we realize. I mean, and what it is is how much of a blessing that we are on those that are around us. And I feel like we are more of a blessing on those around us than what we realize. But I think it's because all too often we get distracted with the fact that we find ourselves shaking our fists at God because we don't always get to do what we want to do and we miss out on everything that is going on around us. Remember that career and injury that you suffered and you were so focused on the fact that you would never get to play the sports again and you lost that scholarship? But the thing that you missed out on was the friendship that you created on the sidelines with that fellow teammate that you still have yet to this day. Or how about that unexpected baby that caused you to not be able to finish high school? When they look at you now, years later, and they see a strong and wonderful mother, and because of that strength, you are an inspiration to that child. And remember that job that you wanted more than anything that turned out to be the worst job in the world for you? Well, the fact of the matter is that you became that you were an actual light for Christ. Now you've brought over half of your coworkers to know Christ. These are all the things that we need to wake up and stop being blinded by our own selfish ambitions. And we need to see how God is moving in our lives. We need to embrace what he is doing and be thankful for it. And instead of saying, why, God? We need to be saying, how, God? We need to say, how, God, are you going to use this in our lives? You see, George had a chance that we would never have. 
He got to see what life was like without him. He got to see the fact that if he wasn't there to help save his brother when they were kids, that his brother would have drowned that day and would not have gone on to become a war hero and save a transport full of troops from being destroyed and killed. If it wasn't for George, Mr. Gower, the pharmacist of the town, would have accidentally packed poison into a medication instead of the true medicine that the child needed and would have wound up spending the better part of his life in jail because of killing that child. Obviously, George would have never married Mary and she would have gone on to become an old maid or a spinster. But the fact that George wasn't there to stop Potter from taking over the town and turning Bedford Falls into Potterville, a sleazy, undesirable town filled with casinos, nightclubs, and bars. One might say that George's purpose in life was to save and protect Bedford Falls, not only from Potter, but themselves as well. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get to see what impact we would have on others if we weren't in their lives. If we did, I guarantee you it would end the same way with George, the same way it did for George. Maybe not on a bridge crying out to God, asking for his life back, saying, I want my life back, God, I want my life back. But we would be asking for it back. Because didn't George ask for his life back earlier? When everything was working out for everyone else in town, and all his friends and all his families, everything was going good for him, for them, and not him. He wanted his life back because he wanted what he had planned. But what he was missing out was the fact that he was a true blessing on those around him. I think that all too often we are quick to overlook how much of an effect we have on someone's life. I mean, sometimes we are more of a blessing than we realize. George would see this when, and what he meant to the town and the people in the town, when word got out that he was in trouble with the money, the $8,000 that were lost, and how it would make him look. So the town got together and helped bail George out of his problem because he was there so many times for them, it was time for them to step up for them. But it was key for what his brother ended the scene with by raising a toast and saying to George Bailey, the richest man in town. I think that each of us can relate to either George or Jonna to some degree. So right now, I would like to try something. And this might be a little weird, so bear with me. So I'd like everybody to take a moment and close your eyes and take a physical inventory of how much the people that are in your life are a blessing to you. All right, still with your eyes closed, I would like you to, to take those same people, the same people that you share your life with and that are a blessing on you. Now I want you to think about how much of a blessing you are to them. Take a few seconds. All right, now, something else that I think we have a tendency of missing is the fact that God's purposes don't always line up with our plans, but eventually they will cross paths. Now, I mentioned earlier that when I was in high school, I had this dream of wanting to become a history teacher, but I knew I didn't have the money, nor did I have the grades to do this. So I just figured that I was going to enter life 
entered a workforce with no real direction other than following what my parents did before me. And that was work hard and care for those around them. So I did this. I went, I got a job, I put my shoulders to the plow. Every job that I've ever worked at, I've worked hard and I established myself in that position. Until one day I felt God calling me. I felt him calling me and saying, I want you to go back to school and learn more about me. So at age 42, I went back to school. And now you could say that I'm a history teacher. Now it wasn't the type of history teacher that I expected to be when I was in high school, but what it is is now I get to tell his story. I get to talk about the greatest history ever, and that is God's story. So the other thing is too, earlier I had mentioned that It's a Wonderful Life was based on a short story entitled The Greatest Gift. But did you know that God has given us the greatest gift that we could ever imagine? You see, God has you here for a purpose. And you affect every one you come into contact with. Romans 8.28 spells it out for this. And we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to the pur- this purpose. To sum this up, I feel as though that there's three groups of people. And I know that each and every one of us falls into one of these three groups. The first one is a believer. The believer that follows God through everything. They are following throughout all the dips and the bends, all the ebbs and the flows but remain in sync with God's purpose on their life through prayer, through faith, and through trust. Therefore, they're receiving the blessing from staying on the course. Then you also have the second one, the believers that are still living their own plans, but busy shaking their fists at God, wallowing in their own miseries, because of their plans aren't working out how they want them to be. These believers are still being used for God's purpose. However, they miss out on seeing the blessings that God, that God's purpose on their life, similar to how Jonah was. Then there's the third group. There's the last group. And these are the ones who don't know who God is. They are the ones that have a life that is empty, one that is void of any purpose. This is the group that needs that gift that I was talking about. And that gift is Jesus. So if you fall into that last, gift, that last group, I am talking to you right now. You see, Jesus came to die for us. His purpose was to fulfill scripture and to give us the greatest gift that we could ever imagine, and that is eternal life with him. Yes, there's gonna be times where things don't always work out the way you want them to go, but rest assured, they will work out. Yes, some days are going to be hard, but you can know for a fact that Christ is there to get you through it. Christ died for us and took our sins and he washed our slate clean something that we could never do on our own and like with any other gift it is there and all you have to do is accept it by asking him in to your life by saying God I know I'm a sinner and I want that peace. I want that gift, that gift of eternal salvation in your son, Jesus Christ. I want that. It's not magical words. It's not anything special that you have to say. It's how you are and how you feel in your heart to give your life over to Christ and know that he is there for you. Father in heaven, I thank you for blessing us with this day, and I thank you, Lord, for giving us 
all this time together. Lord, I pray for each and every person that is watching this and those that may not be watching this. Lord, I pray for health. I pray for sickness as we go about our week this week. I pray for those that need recovery, and I pray for those that need you. I ask, Lord, that you look over us, and I, please, Lord, I pray for health and safety in this week upcoming. I pray this in your holy and son's precious name. Amen.